Well, good morning. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jason Waymar. I'm the lead pastor here at Cross Community. Uh, we're grateful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Today we're beginning a new series uh, where we're looking ahead to Christmas. Uh, I'm excited about what's ahead for us. I know it's a busy season for many, uh, but there's a lot of joy uh, ahead of us as we have the opportunity to celebrate uh, the, the person and the work of Jesus. And so uh, it's just a really, really exciting season. Uh, this Tuesday night, I got to go to our regeneration it was kind of like the, the graduation. They call it commencement. And so uh, Regeneration is our recovery program. Uh, it's for everyone. By the way, it's for you. I would love it if everyone in our church went through it. Our staff ha have all been through it. It's a profound blessing. But uh, one of the things that, that happened this week, I was listening to the testimonies of uh, one of the guys who was commencing, and he, he told a story about how well, his life wasn't going very well. I mean, things were really broken and really painful and uh, not at all going the direction that he wanted them to. And then there was a moment in his life where there was a person who's a member of this church who began to minister to him and speak into his, his life and invited him to come here. And over the last year, like he just got to describe the, the work that God has done as it began to open his eyes and, and help him to see. And he's begun to uh, pursue Jesus. And like there are just many wonderful things taking place. And it's, it's just surprising to me to hear how uh, in a moment things can change, like a single moment, like can literally transform your life. And maybe it was, it's an invitation uh, by a person. Maybe uh, for you, you've had one of those moments in your life and someone shared the gospel with you and everything changed. Or maybe for you, your story's a little bit different. Uh, maybe there's a moment where you met a certain person. Maybe it was a coach or a mentor, someone who began to invest in your life. And you can look back and be like, man, look how, how God used that. Or look how everything changed because of that person or that group of friends that I got connected with. Or I got that opportunity or kind of had a fresh start. Um, maybe for you, though, the, the moment isn't so sweet. Maybe for you, as you look back, there was a moment in your life where something happened. Maybe you got a phone call and things went off the rails. Maybe for you, look back and there's a moment in your life that was a, a real turning point, but that's when things got dark. Maybe you um, entered into a relationship. Maybe for you, uh, it was the diagnosis or the letter of termination or whatever it might be, but you look back to a moment of your life and you think, man, that moment changed things and, and not for the better uh, rather than having gratitude, um, there's grief associated with that. I've found over the years that people tend to come to church for one of two reasons, and maybe you kind of go back and forth at times, and there are certainly other reasons, but one of the reasons people show up to church, you get out of bed on a cold Sunday morning and you show up uh, at a place like this is because you're grateful. For many of us, we're here today because we're thankful for what Jesus Christ has done in us. And so you're motivated by worship today. Like God has transformed me. He's done a work in my heart. And I'm going to come and I'm going to praise him. And we're going to look into the word and, and see like who God is and how he wants us to live. And so that's, that's one of the motives. And then there's another, another motive for, for coming. And, and that's that things aren't going so well. Maybe if you were, you know, to kind of unfold your life a little bit, you would say... Um, what I've been trying hasn't been working at all. I've been working really hard, trying to do the right things. would love to see a change, and I've tried lots of other stuff, and nothing's changing things. And so you find yourself in a church, and uh, you're asking questions, and you're hoping that something will change. Well, today, um, if that's you, if you're here, here either to worship or you're here in search of hope that things can change, I want you to know uh, that I'm going to talk about the one moment that changed everything for us. The one moment that I believe has the power to absolutely transform your life. The moment in history uh, where the, the kind of the, the light of hope uh, began to glow once again, where uh, we could see that there is a hope and a future. And I want you to know that there is hope for you. I don't know what your circumstances or what your situation, but there is hope for you in your life because of this single moment that we're celebrating in this holiday season. And that is the birth of Jesus Christ. He's a a baby born in a town people made fun of, to a, a mother and a Joseph who they'd never come together and she was pregnant and you can draw your own conclusions, right? It was some difficult circumstances and yet in that moment, that manger in that city to those parents, like 
Um, it was a moment that would change the world. It was a moment that was inspired of God. It was a moment that brought hope for us. And so as I speak to you about this moment of a humble beginning but a very triumphant ending today, uh, I want to go back and I want to, as quickly as I can, tell you the story of the Bible because everything in the Bible had been leading up to this point. So I don't know how much you know. We're going to start in Genesis. If you were to begin reading your Bible in Genesis today, you would know that the story of the Bible it begins in creation. God created the heavens and the earth and the, the rivers and the lakes and the oceans and the mountains and the trees and the plants and the animals. All that we know and see, God created that. And it was beautiful and it was perfect. And God, he created mankind in his image. In his image, he made male and female. And God brought them together. And because he is a perfect God who doesn't make mistakes, everything he was made was perfect. But he said something unique about the man and the woman. While everything else was good, male and female together was very good. The world was perfect. Mankind existed in a perfect relationship with God with one another, and with creation. There was no hurting. There was no sickness. There was no suffering. There was no pain. There was fullness of joy. They were fully known. They were naked. They were unashamed. Like, the world was perfect. But if you read very far in Genesis, you'll see that Satan came in in the form of a serpent. And he began to tempt Adam and Eve God had given them one command, hey, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan comes in and said, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, that's not what he said. He said, don't eat from that one tree. Well, what would happen if you did? Well, he said we would surely die if we eat from that tree. Satan begins to sow seeds of doubt. Well, surely you won't die. But instead, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And Adam and Eve, they took the fruit of that tree and they ate when they ate, when they rebelled against God, disobeyed his command, sin entered the world. And everything in all of God's beautiful, perfect creation became broken and marred and scarred by sin. The effects of which would reverberate out through all of God's creation. Adam and Eve, who once enjoyed a perfect relationship with God, each other, and with his creation, suddenly were isolated. They felt shame. They felt guilt. They hid from God and from one another. When sin entered the world, it was like a tsunami of wreckage just began to destroy everything in its wake. You read further in Genesis, you'll see brother murdering, brother Cain killing Abel. And as you work your way through the New Testament, or through the Old Testament, it's like an episode of Jerry Springer. Like lies and deceit and betrayal, abuse, lust, adultery, suffering, pain, sickness, and death. All the result of sin. Now, the good news is that God did not look upon his creation that had sinned against him, his perfect creation that had been broken and scarred by sin, and he didn't walk away from the table. Like, I've had enough, right? I'm done with them. I don't love them anymore. They won't follow me. They won't serve me. As a matter of fact, God had a plan from the very beginning. And so God called a man named Abraham out from his people, out from his nation. He called him uh, to follow him. And Abraham um, follows God, not knowing where he was going. God made a promise and a covenant with Abraham. He said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And Abraham, not being the best guy that ever lived, not being especially faithful or the most righteous person you've ever met, Abraham simply believed God. And the scriptures tell us it was credited to him as righteousness. And God did just as he said he would do um, through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and Joseph. God did indeed build a great nation for himself, the nation of Israel. He said, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people and the world is going to look at you and they're going to see my goodness reflected. Now that nation of Israel, they became enslaved in a place called Egypt under Pharaoh. They cried out to God in their slavery and God heard them. And he began to work on their behalf. And through a series of plagues that plagued the nation of Egypt, Pharaoh was humbled and ultimately decided to let God's people go. 
God led them out of Egypt and across the sea on dry land. He crushed the armies of Pharaoh beneath that same sea. He led them out into the wilderness where every day he would lead them consistently. During the day, there was a cloud that they could follow. When the cloud moved, they moved. During the night, it was a, it was a pillar of fire. Again, when God moved, they moved. When God stayed, they stayed. Every morning, they would wake up and God would feed them with manna on the ground. He would provide water from them, from a rock at times. Every single day, they were seeing that God leads us. God provides for us. God cares for us. He protects us. Still, the people of God, who had been led out of their slavery, who walked across the sea on dry land, they rebelled against God. They went their own way. They did what was right in their own eyes. Rather than following God, they turned to false gods and cast idols. God met with Moses on Mount Sinai. He gave him the Ten Commandments and the law and came down to find the people had uh, built a golden calf to worship. Because of the disobedience of Moses and ultimately of the people, they ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years before God led them into what is known as the promised land. Uh, it was a land flowing with milk and honey, which if that doesn't sound exciting to you, it would have to them, right? It was a land that would have been peaceful and prosperous, and they would have looked forward to being there. Despite their rebellion, despite their sin, God did bring his people into this promised land that they could inhabit, that they could call their own. He built them into a nation, and yet over and over and over, the people rebelled against God. They turned aside to other gods. They each did what was right in their own eyes. So God sent them judges to help deliver them and to lead them back to him. And still they turned aside. Then they cried out for a king. And so God gave them Saul and David and Solomon and many other kings. And still they didn't follow him. So God sends them the prophets to speak into their context to the nation of Israel um, admonishing them and calling them to return to God. God even gave them over to their sin. They would be conquered by foreign armies and held captives in foreign places. When they would humble themselves and repent, God would bring them back, but it wouldn't be long before they were sinning against him again. Over and over and over, another king, another prophet, another warning to return to the Lord, followed by another time of sin and disobedience. And then... There was 400 years of silence. No more prophets pointing them back to God. No more voices. I mean, you think about 400 years. We've been a nation for a couple hundred, right? So twice as long as America has been in existence, it was just silence. And then the voice of one crying in the wilderness a man named John the Baptist who wore garments of camel's hair, kind of coarsely woven together. He ate locusts. He began to declare the message that uh, the Messiah was coming, the chosen one, one whose sandals he wasn't worthy to stoop down and untie, that the Son of God, the Redeemer, had come to rescue God's people from their sins. And so people went out to listen. They began to hear and anticipate when news that this Savior had been born reached the, the ears of King Herod, who was kind of the ruler of the whole region. Um, it says, the scriptures tell us that, that Herod was deeply troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. They had been awaiting the arrival of the Savior. They were looking forward to this moment where God, who, who was the God of the nation of Israel, when he would restore and he would redeem his people, where he would rescue them from their sins. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there in a manger, with Mary and Joseph, and what seemed like a humble beginning would end up with a triumphant ending. You see, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. In the person of Jesus, God had stepped down out of heaven. He sent his one and only son to earth to take on human flesh. Not to be served, but to serve. And to offer himself as a sacrifice for many. In the moment of Jesus' birth, everything changed 
for the world. The people who, because of sin, couldn't follow God. They constantly turned away from Him. Their lives were marked by sin and destruction and ultimately death. People who were without hope because God came in flesh, because that baby was born in the manger, because of that moment, everything changed. Everything changed for them and everything changed for us. That moment was so significant in history. That one single moment with the birth of Jesus, when God became flesh and made his dwelling among us, it literally split uh, B.C. from A.D. It split all of recorded history. There We mark things before Jesus Christ and then after his death. Um, A.D. stands for Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. That's when the Savior came and literally divided recorded history. B.C. from A.D. It's when everything changed, both for them and ultimately for the entire world, when hope entered in. So this morning, I want to give you four reasons that we have to hope. Four reasons that the moment of Jesus' birth, that when God became flesh, four reasons that that changes everything for us. Four reasons that we can have hope. You see, that moment, it marked the birth of Jesus, the Savior of the world, the hope and the light for us. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. That baby, Jesus, born in the manger to the Virgin Mary, he would grow up. Here in Luke chapter 4, the writer of the Gospel of Luke He's telling us that Jesus has just been tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He'd fasted, and Satan came and he tempted him in various ways. And Jesus resisted the temptation, and he's going to begin his earthly ministry. So Jesus returns to the town where he grew up, the town of Nazareth. And he enters into the synagogue, and on this day, he's going to be the teacher, if you will. He takes the scroll. Uh, It's Isaiah chapter 61 that he's reading from. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18... Jesus read these words from Isaiah 61. He read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And if you were a good Jew sitting in the synagogue on that day, Uh, You would have nodded. You would have heard this text. You've probably heard people teach on it before. This was the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus, talking. um, uh, He was speaking to the people, and you might even remember how God had delivered his people. But if you were a good Jew listening to this on this day, you would have had no idea just how profound a deliverance was coming. That when the prophet Isaiah spoke these words, that he didn't just mean a a physical deliverance for Israel in a moment, but rather it was going to be an eternal deliverance that would have implications not just for the nation of Israel, but for the whole world. They didn't understand that the fulfillment of this uh, prophecy was beyond anything they could imagine. So in Luke chapter uh, uh, chapter 4 verse 20, Jesus continues on says this, it says, And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Well, Jesus hadn't read very much, just a couple of verses. Um, <clears throat> fairly short sermon. If you were a kid, probably thinking, all right, I'm going to get out here a little earlier this week. It says that the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus as he rolled up the scroll, he handed it back, and he sat down. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And if you were listening, you would have been like, what does this mean? And what Jesus was telling the people, he's like, I'm the one the prophet was talking about. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who has come to proclaim good news to the poor. I'm the one who's come to proclaim liberty for the captives and sight to the blind and freedom for the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
That's me. I'm the Son of God. I'm the Messiah. And it wasn't just for them. It was for the whole world. You see, the moment of Jesus' birth was so significant. It changed everything. Because this was a moment where God began to initiate not just the creation of the world. The world wasn't left in its fallen state where God was initiating his plan and his work of redemption for the world. You see, Jesus, who was reading from the prophet Isaiah and claiming to be the Messiah, was ultimately going to go to the cross for the sins of the world. So why was the coming of Christ so important? And why did it change everything? I want to give you four reasons that the coming of Jesus literally changed everything, both for them and for us. I want to give you four reasons that the coming of Jesus Christ can change everything for you. That this moment where you're hearing the word of God for you, where you're hearing what Jesus said, not just to Jews 2,000 years ago, but would say to us why it changes everything for us. The first, again, Jesus is reading from Isaiah, quoting, the first thing Jesus said that he was going to do is to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, if you're sitting here and you're like, eh, I'm not really... I'm not poor, you know, middle class-ish. Small town, we're lower, middle class probably. You know, we're not really rich, not really poor. It's not exactly what he's talking about. When Jesus said, when he come to proclaim good news to the poor, he wasn't talking about physical riches, earthly wealth. But he was talking about our spiritual condition. In Romans chapter 3, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I don't know where you think of yourself in terms of your spiritual prowess, if you will. I, you know, maybe you're like, hey, you know, I'm an A-teamer. Um, maybe you're a B-teamer. Maybe you would get an F if you think about your spirituality. Um, but what Paul said to the church at Rome is that every single one of us has fallen short. <clears throat> We've sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And so the standard for our lives, the standard for righteousness, is the perfection of God. And, and I've, I've never encountered anyone yet uh, who would say that, oh, I've been perfect throughout my life. The issue for us, the thing that has left us spiritually poor, is the issue of our sin. And every single one of us in this room, whether we would acknowledge it or not, from birth, we have sinned against God, just like the nation of Israel. We can read about it with them and think, why do you keep sinning against God? It always goes bad for you. But we do the same things. We sin against God. We've fallen short of His glory. Before God, we find ourselves wanting. Rather than being spiritually rich, rather than offering God anything good, instead, we, we believe what the prophet Isaiah said about us, that all our attempts at righteousness. You know, we, we were just home with family over Thanksgiving. I don't know how it is for you. Maybe you like to go home to your, your family and, you know, you drop hints about how your life's going. Things are going pretty good. You know, I've been helping some people, serving the soup kitchen. You know, I got my life together. Um, uh, again, I mowed my neighbor's lawn, helped the old lady across the street. Things are going pretty well for me. The prophet Isaiah would say that all our righteous deeds, all of our attempts even to be good, are like filthy rags in the sight of God. We've fallen short of His glory. We're spiritually poor. Sin, rather than leaving us spiritually alive as God created us to be, where we have a relationship with, with God, a right relationship with Him and other people and all of God's creation instead, whether we want to admit it or not, we have perpetuated the brokenness and the fallenness of creation with our own sin. We're spiritually poor. Jesus says, good news to those of you who find yourself spiritually poor. Good news to those of you with a reputation, those of you who've blown it, those of you who have tried really hard to be good but found yourself still falling into the same sin, there's good news for those of you who are poor. That baby, born in that moment, 
laid in the manger, had come to rescue us from our sins and to restore us to a right relationship with God. You see, the wages of our sin is death. Romans 6.23, the wage, what we deserve for our sin is death. That's what we're owed because of our sin. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, Jesus came to earth to live a perfect, sinless life. He set an example for us to show us what true and abundant life looked like. And then Jesus Christ went to the cross, and there he suffered, and he bled, and he died. And he did it for us. And I want to say it more specifically. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He knew your sin. And he knew the good, the bad, and the ugly about you. And Jesus Christ wanted to restore you to a right relationship with him. He wanted to set you free from the penalty of sin. He wanted to set you free from the power of sin that you could live the true and abundant life. So this moment in the birth of Jesus Christ, it could be the moment that changes everything for you because it's the moment that you stop trying to be good enough. It's the moment that you stop trying to to live well enough or have good deeds outweigh the bad deeds. And it's the moment that you start trusting in Jesus Christ and you stop trusting in yourself. When Jesus went to the cross, God took the sin of the world. Those of us who would trust not in ourselves but in him, he took our sin, your sin, the things you're most ashamed of, and he placed them on his son Jesus. And there on the cross, Jesus endured the penalty of sin for us. He endured the wrath that we deserved. And God took that perfect, sinless life that Jesus lived And he credited that to our account. And Jesus didn't just pay your debt in full. He credited something too. It's the free gift of eternal life that he credited to your account. So the reason that I would say to you that the birth of Jesus Christ changed everything when God stepped down out of heaven and took on flesh is because he was coming to declare good news to the poor. To those of us who could never be good enough to save ourselves, we can enjoy a right relationship with God again. We can have our sins forgiven and we can be set free from the power of sin. There's good news for the poor. The second thing that Jesus said he was going to do for us, for the world, good news for the poor. The second, he came to declare freedom for the captives. Some of you, some of us, have been held captive by our sin. And whether it's a really, really public addiction or a very, very private compulsion, many of us in this room have been controlled by sin for too long. Like the nation of Israel, we might want to do better, we might realize that God's way is perfect. We might know that the, what the good things are or the bad things are, right? If we were to give a, an exam on morality, um, most of us could pass the exam, right? In any given situation, it's better to tell the truth than it is to lie. It's better to walk in humility than it is in pride. It's better uh, not to steal than it is to take from other people. We shouldn't murder, right? If you get that one wrong, you got issues, right? Well, the problem for us is not that we can't ever know what's right and what's wrong, that we can't do what we know to do. We can't seem to do the right things consistently. And over and over and over, we fall back into sin. Like the nation of Israel, we keep sinning against God, turning to other things. Maybe for you in your life, your life has been controlled by an addiction for far too long. And Maybe a whole bunch of people know, and maybe you're the only person that knows, but I want you to know that God knows. And the reason that the birth of Jesus Christ changed everything is that Jesus came. He was born. He took on flesh that he might come and declare to you freedom for the captives. That you are no longer bound under the power of sin because of the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is power to overcome sin. That you don't have to walk in the darkness and the destruction anymore. That you can enjoy freedom from whatever it is that has its grip on you. And maybe you've been fighting it for a very long time. And maybe you're on the verge of of giving up hope. Maybe you're here today to hear Jesus declare to you there is freedom for the captives. And that freedom 
is found in Him and Him alone. In recovery, <clears throat> the first step, and this is any recovery program, but it's, it's true of ours that we do here, regeneration. The first step of recovery is admitting that you are powerless over your addiction and your brokenness and your sinful patterns. You just admit, I can't control this. Man, I've been trying. I'm 42 years old. I've been working really hard, and I cannot seem to control this thing. And then the next two steps are to believe and trust in God that he can heal and restore that which is broken within you. Jesus came that he might declare freedom for the captives. If you're in bondage to sin today, anger, lust, pornography, gossip, pride, insecurity, you fill in the blank. There's freedom from sin in Christ Jesus. He came to break the power of sin. That we don't have to continue the pattern any longer. That we can live in fullness of joy and in His abundance, walking the path that we already know to walk. Jesus coming changed everything because He came to proclaim good news to the poor. Freedom for the captives. And the third thing is recovery of sight to the blind. Maybe you're not a notorious sinner right? You haven't showed up in jailbirds yet. Maybe uh, people don't write about you on Facebook and post about how terrible you've treated them on social media. Um, maybe you've just been wandering through your life, and your life feels like one wrong turn after another. Dead end after dead end after dead end. And rather than things getting better, they seem to only be getting worse. And you've been trying to find your way, and you're trying to figure out what in life's going to satisfy you, What's your purpose is here? Why am I even on this earth? Like, what is the point of life altogether? Jesus says, I've, I've come to proclaim recovery of sight for the blind. You see, what sin does is it blinds us to the spiritual realities that are all around us. You and I were made for a relationship with God, to walk and to talk with Him, that we would look not to the world and not to ourselves to find out what is true or the path we should walk, but we should look to God and to see how he would want us to live, that he's actually laid out good deeds in advance that he wants us to walk in. You were made on purpose. God placed you in this place at this time in the family that you were born in, into your profession, into this city or in your neighborhood. He did all of that on purpose. It's not by accident. And yet because of sin, we can't see the purposes of God. And we don't know why we exist. We're just wandering around in the darkness. If that's you today, I want you to know that Jesus, he quoted the prophet Isaiah. He was born as a baby. He took on flesh that he might proclaim to you recovery of sight for the blind, that you might see what God has for you, who he is, his glory, what he's done. And the invitation of Jesus over and over and over throughout the New Testament, it's not follow a list of rules. It's not be a better person or try harder. It's come and follow me. Hey, you want to know life? You want to know fullness? You want to know joy and abundance? Come and follow me. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. So the birth of Jesus Christ, it changed everything. Because he came, God in the flesh, to proclaim good news to the poor and freedom for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. And the final one is to declare freedom or the oppressed. I don't know what's in your past. But if you've lived very long, you've been hurt by someone. Maybe for you, you've been carrying around the hurt caused by someone else for far too many years. My story, uh, growing up in church and had a great family, people that loved me, but for much of my young life, I felt like I was carrying 100 pounds on my back. Uh, some things that happened to me sexually as a kid that uh, I'd never told anyone about. Man, for a guy who was trying so hard to walk with Jesus, and I wanted to be a good kid, and I wanted to enjoy life, it felt like I was walking around with 100 pounds on my back. It was exhausting. It's hard to be victorious when you got an extra 100 pounds. You know what I mean? It's hard to feel joy. And I was trying really hard to be good and to live for the Lord. 
but I hadn't been set free yet. Maybe for you it's similar. And you got hurt, caused by other people. Maybe someone labeled you as a kid. Maybe they've sinned against you. And you've been burdened by bitterness or unforgiveness, anger, rage. Maybe you just feel like you're walking around carrying 100 pounds all the time. Life always feels heavy. Joy is always muted. The birth of Jesus Christ changes everything for you. And Jesus would want you to hear what he quoted on that day. He's come to proclaim freedom for the oppressed. Jesus is the one who restores that which is broken within us. He's the one that carries our burdens. The invitation of Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. And I don't know what your story is. I don't know where you've been or what's happened in your life. But the reason that we celebrate at Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of our Lord in the flesh, is because it changed everything for us. I want you to know that there's hope for you, that God knows you and He sees you and He loves you. And He wants to give you hope. And He wants to give you a future. He wants to set you free. He wants to help you see who you are and why He created you. And all of that begins not with you working harder, pushing through, trying a little bit more. It comes with you trusting in Jesus Christ. It comes with you stopping trusting in yourself and your own ability to be good and instead surrendering, surrendering yourself to His goodness. No longer going your own way, but instead following Him. So there's two responses this morning to this message. The first is worship. And I look forward to this morning because I get to worship Jesus Christ who has saved me from my sin and He's set me free. And so I worship and I praise God. I'm so thankful for what He's done. And if that's you today, man, you've been set free. You got to share your story in recovery. Man, you have a, a story about what Jesus has done. Here in our response time, I'm going to invite you to worship Jesus Christ. Man, just offer your heart to Him in praise. But if you're here today, and you've never trusted in Jesus, you find yourself weary and oppressed and burdened by sin, feels like you're wandering around in the darkness and you can't find your way. If you've been held captive by sin. You haven't known God. Today I want to challenge you to by faith receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe that God came in flesh in the form of a baby in a manger. That he grew up and he lived a perfect sinless life and offered himself on the cross for your sin that you might find new life and freedom in him. Jesus loves you. And he wants to give you the life that is true and abundant. Life that is beyond anything that you could imagine. That you'd be just like the Jews hearing as Jesus declared Isaiah 61. You would have no idea just how good he is. Just how great a savior he is. But by faith you might receive him and begin to walk that out in your life. Would you bow with me? Father... We do praise you for your goodness. That God, what we deserve, what I deserved was, was death and separation from you because of my sin. But God, you and your grace, you didn't leave me to wallow in sin or to carry my burdens on my own. But God, you're the God who invited me to know you, to trust in you. You're the God who saved me. You died that I might live. You bore the punishment for, our, for my sin and for our sin. Lord, I pray for the men and women in this room that don't know you, that today would be the day of salvation, that they might trust in you, no longer trusting in themselves, but in you and you alone to save them from their sin, from the penalty and from the power of sin, that they might walk in freedom, in your light and in your truth. God, we pray that you would draw our hearts to you, that we would trust in you more fully. May you have your way in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand. As I said before,